So I'm Mika Tomir, and I'm stepping in for Deborah Umberson. So she really does groundbreaking work on everything I'm going to talk about. So you should look into her if this is maybe not familiar to you. But um, speaking today about caregiving, we know from this report that the CDC just put out last month using BRFIS data, which is really a state-by-state -state data set, that about 22% of U.S. adults report providing some care to a friend or family member in the past 30 days. Um, and the AARP estimates that if we were to compensate for this care, it'd be worth $470 billion, um, which is more than we spend per year on Medicaid, right? So this is just an incredibly key part of our healthcare system in the United States and incredibly necessary, especially to the people who are receiving this care. Um, caregivers are, the majority are, are women. So about 60% of caregivers are women, which isn't even actually that huge of a majority. Um, um, but, and most of that difference is coming from adult children. And we know from a lot of different studies that daughters are much more likely to provide care than sons, and daughter-in-laws are even more likely to provide care than sons. Um, and this gap is so much to the extent that this article by Bot, who's looking at dementia, concluded that the best long-term care insurance is a conscientious one, right? Um, this gap has decreased in recent years, so we have seen this shift where more sons are providing care and more spouses are providing care. This is based on a new article in the Journal of Marriage and Family by Rebecca Glauber, and she looks at HRS data. And if we look at the early baby boomers, which is this orange line, you can see that the gender gap in women and men providing any care to their parents and women and men providing intense care to their, care to their parents has really decreased over time. Um, and then we also know, um, I felt bad I wasn't talking about the positive benefits, but Dr. Krauss talked about some positive benefits of providing support, so I'm going to focus on the bad. And we know um, that giving care comes with negative health outcomes in terms of mental health, physical health across a lot of outcomes, less time for exercise, sleep, right? Lots of health behaviors that come out of this. Um, and one of the theoretical frames we use to think about this um, is this idea of role engulfment, which builds on Lynn Perlin's idea about the stress process model, that caregiving is a chronic stressor, and it's also an unexpected, unpredictable stressor, right? So I can plan that I'm gonna have a baby in nine months, of get my affairs in order for that. You can't plan for a parent to have a stroke, right? And then you have to step in and day to day is just really different. Um, it can be all encompassing, it leads to psychological distress, it leads to worse health habits. There's a physiological response from that, right? We have biomarker data on this with the immune response, allostatic load and other things like that. Leads to illness. Um, mixed data on what it really does for mortality caregiver burden, but we really see it with illness. Um, and women are more negatively impacted by this whole process than men. So even as the gap in um, amount of care provided by men and women is shrinking, there's still greater health disparities for women from providing that care. Um, and I've done an article looking at HRS data that just even being married to someone with health issues is worse for the health of women than the health of men, not even thinking about um, caregiving. So I'm gonna focus on why. So why do we see these gender disparities in the effect of caregiving on health? Um, and what I first want to do is back up and say that I think that the way we think about caregiving and care receiving doesn't reflect how caregiving and care receiving actually looks for most people. And we tend to think of caregiving and care receiving as you have a healthy caregiver who's providing care for someone who has health needs. But more and more with population aging, we're seeing that the caregiver themselves has health issues that they have, um, and that women are more likely to be caregivers with initial health issues, right? So um, part of this goes with what Dr. Crimmins was talking about with more functional limitations at later ages for women. Um, and we also know from work that I've done looking at the HRS and also work we've done with interviews and some other surveys is that women caregivers are less likely to let their own health issues keep them from providing care. So um, if you look at people who have spouses with care needs, the husband is more likely to not provide care if he has poor health and the wife, her health doesn't seem to factor in in the same way, or she has to be really, really um, ill, right, or have a lot of functional limitations to not step in and provide that care for herself. Um, we also know a reason that, that might impact why women have worse health from caregiving is that in spouses, when the husband is the caregiver, um, the wife tends to give him a lot of support, right? So care isn't bi unidirectional, it's bidirectional, especially when there's a, a husband who's the caregiver. Um, and this is from a study we did with an interview and this woman, Gwen, was dealing with brain cancer, and her husband's been taking care of her for a while, and she says she noticed he was really tired from the caregiving. She told him to go take a vacation, and he did, right? So he takes his break, and we have done a lot of these interviews, and we just don't have examples of men doing the same things for their caregiving wives, so at least in this kind of extreme way. So this is 
a good buffer that many caregivers might have. We know from parental care that um, when the husband is the caregiver for his wife, the ch adult children are more likely to step in and help the husband out, whereas they think the wife has got it, right? That, that mom knows what she's doing and maybe dad they're worried about. Um, another side of this where context is really important is that women are more likely to have dual conflicts when they're providing care. So you think about the sandwich generation. Um, I just saw the author of Kathy wrote a, the comic Kathy wrote a book where she says it's actually the beanie generation because the squeeze is so tight. Um, that a lot of, uh, especially women caregivers, are providing care to multiple people at the same time. And some of this is also just the rise of single motherhood, right? So you're providing care for your minor children or adult children, and you're also providing care for your parents at the same time, maybe even a spouse, a grandparent, right? And women are more likely to be doing this and more likely to have been doing this over a period of years. Um, the other side of it is that we no longer see a gender gap in being in the paid workforce and caregiving. So it used to be that men caregivers were much more likely to be in the paid workforce than women caregivers. That's no longer the case. But it is the case that women caregivers um, see caregiving impact their earnings much more negatively than men do. And actually, again, that JMS study by Rebecca Glauber that just came out shows there's no impact of men's caregiving on wages. Um, whereas there's this continuous impact on women, and women who provide care are more likely to be in poverty in later life, right? And that poverty clearly is going to impact their health. Um, and then the last kind of mechanism we should think about is that we have found from a lot of meta-analyses from different types of studies that men and women, similar number of hours, getting to similar rates of care, but the types of care they provide are really, really different. Um, and men um, women tend to provide more emotional support, so we can think of caregiving as financial, instrumental, right, those help with activities of daily living, um, a lot more medical care that we're seeing in recent years that families are picking up on. Um, and then there's this emotional element, which actually can have a pretty negative impact on your health, um, and that women just do more of this. And we've done a series of different interviews with lots of different couples looking at their caregiving. Um, and a theme that comes up a lot is that women talk about when they're caregiving, their goal is to do it all. And they talk about this high bar. And I have two quotes here that show this. So in this one married couple, we're interviewing the husband and the wife together. And she says, I didn't have any home health care aides come in because I can handle it myself. Um, and she said, I did the wound care. And even the doctor said, I did a good job. And her husband said, you're going to hurt your arm patting yourself if I'm not coming back like that, right? So this indication that maybe she's doing it all, but it's not appreciated in the way that we might expect. Um, or this woman, Lori, says, I work hard. I listen to how we breathe in the morning, right? It's just a really intense process that she's describing here in terms of the caregiving. Um, when we interview men caregivers, they have a different bar, and their wives have a different bar for them. And they talk more about this idea of doing the best I can, which is actually a phrase that comes up a lot. And this is in no way meant to be disparaging. This is no way meant to be he's not doing enough. It's just a different bar, right? And you can think about the stress from doing it all, trying to do it all versus the stress of doing the best you can, right? And how that's gonna impact health differently for these different kids. All right, a big caveat that relates to a lot of what we're talking about um, is the overwhelming majority of the spousal caregiving is in a different sex couple context. So when we talk about gender of the caregiver, we're almost always assuming that the spouse is a different gender, right? So it's hard to know if it's your own gender that matters or it's just that you're caring for a man, right? Or, you know, whatever. The case may be. So we've done um, a lot of work looking at same-sex couples. This is Deborah Umber saying Breeze works for me and a few other of us. Um, and what we find is in some cases, it is your own gender that really seems to matter the most. So in work that we've done um, that's shown that idea that care receivers provide a lot of support to caregivers if the care receiver is a woman, that's true in same-sex women couples, and that's also true in different sex couples where the woman's providing support to her husband. Um, on the other hand, these findings that we have that the illness is most stressful for women, right? A, a spouse's illness is most, most stressful for women. That really is only the case for women who are married to men, right? So there's, um, and we find this a lot in our research on, on different sex couples that there's the most kind of tension in those relationships around caregiving because of different ideas of what should be done and expectations. Um, okay, so areas of future research. Um, so glad to follow Dr. Thorpe on this, and we really need to think more about an intersectional perspective. Um, what I just illustrated was not just assuming heterosexuality or heteronormativity is a big piece of this. Um, I think with gender, what we've all been talking about, moving beyond the gender binary and thinking about how um, couples with transgender people in them, how they provide or receive care, thinking about gender non-binary, gender non-conforming, um, different ways of measuring gender. 
Um, and I think we really, especially today, as um, this is Vicki Friedman's work, has she's shown that we're seeing this increasing health disparities, including around healthy life expectancies in terms of gender, um, in terms of race, we're seeing this um, in terms of SES. And I think we need to think more about what this means for the caregivers, right? So what does it mean to be maybe a black woman who has more people in your network with, with health issues due to different processes of racism, right? What does it mean to provide care um, within that context, right? Um, and I have here, we need to think about how is caregiving and receiving distributed within and across families in ways that reflect, reduce, or exacerbate gender, SES or socioeconomic status, racial, ethnic, and sexual orientation-based health disparities. Um, and with an intersectional perspective, we need to think about the roles of institutions, policies, and other social structural forces, right? So I talk about this idea that women have this bar of doing it all, and women have this bar of doing the best I can. That doesn't just come out of them, right? This is something that the different structures that they're embedded in um, have an impact on, right? And not having good paid leave for caregivers, right? That also have an impact on how caregiving is experienced by men and women. Um, we also need to think more about a life course perspective um, and how patterns of care develop throughout the life course. Um, it doesn't just happen that daughters provide more care than sons, right? This is something that develops in a family over time. Um, and I have here a project that I'm doing where we're interviewing older couples in which both spouses have some kind of health issue. And so they're engaging in mutual caregiving to a certain extent. Um, and we've asked them, this is overwhelming, but we've asked them for every health issue they have experienced in their entire marriage and how they handled that health issue over time. Right? So kind of two things that come out of this, and then we ask for the future. What do you anticipate is going to happen in the future? Is that um, people, caregiving doesn't just appear at the end of life. People develop periods of providing care for each other. Everything from what you did when your spouse was pregnant, right? Or what you did when your spouse had the flu, right? Um, and so we kind of develop this over time. Um, and these experiences accumulate in the body, right? So if you provide a lot of care for a lot of time and it just, has been really stressful and draining on you and it's never felt appreciated, that's going to build over time. And a lot of our caregiving studies just look at one point of time and so we missed a lot here. Um, with a life first perspective, we need to think about how this has changed across cohorts. Um, and this is especially important as our family forms continue to diversify, right? And we know that part of the reason we're seeing more diversification of family forms in later life is because women are exiting, well exiting, their spouse has died from like a long period of, of caregiving and they don't want to do it again. So they're entering cohabiting unions more often, they're entering long dating unions more often because they don't want to provide care. But the research we have from data or from Europe is showing that they're providing it anyway, right? So they're entering these diverse family forms rather than getting remarried, but they're still providing care. So what does that mean for their health? Um, and then the final thing I'll say with data and method needs is we do have great data on caregiving. Um, we have great longitudinal data. The HRS has great family level dyadic data. Um, we need more intergenerational data. I think we need to know more, especially about how grandchildren might provide for their grandparents, right? Especially with shifting family forms. Um, but we, we need um, longitudinal data for caregiving and same sex relationships. We don't really have that. So we can't really tease apart any of these causal issues. Um, we need more data from non-traditional family arrangements. We don't know much about like family supports, for example. Um, and then we would just benefit from more multifaceted measures of caregiving. Right. Thank you.